Hi, I'm Rad. And I'm Bren. And we're astronomers at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. We'll be taking on a tour of the night sky and showing you what to look for in the month of August using the virtual planetarium Stellarium. Now there's loads to see with just your eyes, but it might be worth taking a camera with you and snapping whatever you see, because we'd love to see your photographs of the night sky. And if you do, you can tweet them to us and our Twitter handle is at ROG Astronomers. Now, first off, we've got a few observing tips before we start. Uh, the best time to look at objects is when they're at their highest point in the sky. Um, and this is because the light travels through less atmosphere and you don't get as much distortion. Also, unless you're looking at the moon, you've got to let your eyes adapt to the darkness. You can use a red torch if you do need some light. And also, very importantly, once you're outside looking at the stars, you might get hooked just like us. So make sure you're dressed warmly for the occasion so you can really enjoy your stargazing session. Well, I've got to say, at the moment, we are going through a heat wave, so the main thing to worry about at night is mosquitoes. But even so, it can get a little bit chilly at night. True. OK, so we're going to show you the night sky at 10 o'clock at night. And the first thing to do is to find north. And we can do this by looking for the plough. Uh, and in the planetarium, people often think it looks a little bit like a saucepan or a kite. But our ancestors called it the plough, which uh, it's essentially it's kind of a medieval lawnmower. And uh, the plough points towards Polaris. It's also part of Ursa Major, the rest of the constellation. And that's too faint uh, to see from the city. And once you've found Polaris, look directly down and you'll be facing north. Once you've found the plough, you should look out for Cassiopeia. And that's a constellation that's sort of in an M or W shape, made up of five stars. OK, so now you're facing north, you should turn around and face the opposite direction, south, because there are lots of interesting objects to look at in this part of the sky. So if you look for the bright red supergiant, Antares, in the constellation Scorpius, uh, this is often referred to as the heart of the scorpion. Now, Antares is 12 million years old. Now that sounds very, very old, but actually it's only a fraction of the age of the sun. Well, that's only a wee baby compared to the sun. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really, really young. However, it is reaching the end of its life, unlike the sun, I should say. Um, stars more massive than the sun have much shorter lifetimes uh, because they exhaust hydrogen in their cores more rapidly. Antares would stretch out beyond the orbit of Mars if it was in the centre of our solar system, which means we would be living inside this giant star. Another bright star to look at is Arcturus in the constellation Boatis. This is an orange giant star whose light has taken 40 years to reach us. Arcturus can be found by following the arc of the handle of the plough. Follow the arc to Arcturus. Very nice, I like that. And uh, in the constellation Hercules, uh, it houses a beautiful globular cluster called M13, and that's 22,000 light years away. And globular clusters look like a compact ball of diamonds, and they're often pinkish orange in colour, due to the high fraction of cooler, older, redder dwarf stars. M13 has 300,000 stars. So imagine what the night sky would be like on that planet, uh, say if there was a planet orbiting one of those stars. In fact, it'd be so bright that you could read and at night just by using the light of the stars in that cluster. Really? Wow. So two planets can be seen over the summer, and these lie within the zodiac band. Although they're getting quite low in the sky, so we advise you catch them while you can. It's a little bit of an astronomical challenge, that one. And the zodiac signifies the paths of the planets and the moon and the sun as they move across the sky. And this is because our solar system is disc shaped. It's basically a rather large space frisbee. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it. Um, over towards the south, if we look towards the constellation of Virgo, um, we'll see the fourth rocky planet in our solar system, Mars. Now, Mars looks like a bright pink star in the sky, and it looks really pretty through binoculars, so we definitely recommend looking at it. Um, to see the disk of the planet, you would need to use quite a large telescope, and we recommend a minimum of an 8-inch mirror. And if you take a long exposure photograph through the telescope, you may even see the white ice caps at the poles. 
Now, I don't know if you're aware, we landed a big rover on Mars back in August 2012, around about the time of the Olympics. And this rover is called Curiosity. Now, once it landed in Gale Crater, the first thing it did was to take selfies. So there are lots <laughs> of photographs of the rover um, in, in this huge crater. But eventually it turned its cameras towards the surface and the surrounding environment. And it's looking to see if Mars was once habitable and we know for sure that there used to be liquid water in the form of streams and rivers flowing on Mars billions of years ago. What we don't know is how long that water was there for and whether life ever had a chance to flourish. So we might not ever find life on Mars, but we may be sending some life up there in the future. That's right. It appears humans will be going to Mars. So people might be sent to Mars within the next 20 or 30 years. And there's a privately funded Mars One mission that hopes to send four people to Mars every two years, starting in 2024. I think the age of space travel is finally getting closer. Um, would you go to Mars, Rad? What do you think? Um, well, it does look like a bit of a hostile planet, but if there's Wi-Fi and a big cake shop, then maybe. How about you? No, I'm with you on that. Yeah, Absolutely. Get that Wi-Fi and cake shop installed and I'm there. And speaking of Mars again, beyond the orbit of Mars is the asteroid belt and there are two resident objects that are visible in the sky and that's Vesta and Ceres. These are possibly too faint to see with the naked eye unless conditions are clear and very dark and you have awesome eyesight as well but they should be visible through binoculars. And Vesta is the brightest asteroid visible from Earth. Uh, seven of them could fit across the moon. Uh, it had its first visitor in the form of a spacecraft called Dawn which reached the asteroid in July 2011. Dawn took lots of photos like any tourist, and it found gullies with evidence of erosion, possibly by water. Uh, Dawn left Vesta in September 2012, and now it's on its way to Ceres, and is expected to reach the dwarf planet in February 2015. Ceres is the closest dwarf planet to us. The second closest is Pluto, all the way beyond Neptune. Okay, so moving on from uh, asteroids to a rather large body called Saturn. Um, Saturn is the second largest planet in our solar system, and you can see it in the southwest in the constellation of Libra. Now, I can just about make out the shape of the rings through my 15 by 70 binoculars. Now, the 15 uh, gives you the magnification, and the number 70 gives you the size of each lens in millimetres. And through a telescope, you may even spot the four largest moons, and, and they're called Mimas, Enceladus, Rhea, and Titan. Now Mimas is a funny one because it looks a little bit like the Death Star from Star Wars. It's got a huge <laughs> crater carved out on the surface. Now did you know that we sent a space probe to Titan? It landed on Titan in 2004 and it analysed the atmosphere and the surface of this alien moon. And it found, get this, rivers and lakes. Sounds beautiful. On Titan, absolutely. However, those rivers and the lakes and the rain on Titan doesn't consist of liquid water, but consists of liquid methane. Uh -oh. Now, methane, we do, we do have methane on the Earth, and it exists as a gas, and we produce methane if we eat too many beans or vegetables. So, uh, imagine that in the form of rain. Not very Just nice. swimming in that oh, rain, yeah, uh, uh, very nice. No, thank you. Now, moving on to something a little bit more pleasant, we hope. Uh, if you really like fireworks, you don't have to wait until the 5th of November because on the 12th of August, we have the peak of the brilliant Perseid meteor shower. Now, these are often referred to as shooting stars, but in fact, they are not stars at all. And actually, at the observatory, we often get asked the difference between meteors and meteorites. Well... Meteors are small grains of dust or pebbles that usually originate from a comet, a ball of rock and ice hurtling through the solar system at high speeds. When these comets swing past the sun, they start to crumble, leaving behind a trail of debris as well as a beautiful tail of gas and dust. So basically they're littering the solar system. Yep, that's right. They are the litter bugs of the solar system. And, and we orbit the sun at a whopping 30 kilometers per second. Wow. And we plough through this leftover cometary debris around the same time every year, giving rise to this regular meteor shower. And the Perseids come from a comet called Swift Tuttle that lives in a region of the solar system called the Kuiper Belt, which is also the home of Pluto. Okay. 
And now, meteorites. They're the rocks from the asteroid belt that have actually survived their journey through the Earth's atmosphere and have reached the surface of the Earth. We have a few meteorites uh, here on display in the Astronomy Centre at the observatory, and they're pretty special to look at. They're the same age as the Earth, the Sun, and the rest of the solar system, four and a half billion years old. So, on the 12th of August, you may see up to 100 meteors per hour radiating outwards from the constellation of Perseus, which is why they are called the Perseids. Now, I suggest going to a very dark place, away from city lights, to look for them. However, this year, there will be a bright, waning gibbous moon in the way, making it a little harder to spot those fainter streaks. But it is still worth going out to see nature's very own firework display. <laughs> 